We're building up godly men for a better tomorrow. This is On the Edge with Ken Harrison, where we inspire men of integrity to put faith into action together. Just before we get into today's episode, we'd like to invite you to subscribe to our weekly devotional group. Just text the two words, Promise Keepers, to 31996. Every week you'll receive a challenging devotional that will inspire you to put your faith into action in the real world. Again, text Promise Keepers to 31996. And now, here's today's show. What's up, John? Good to see you, my friend. Been a while. It has been a while. And uh, it's the first time I've had social talk with you where we weren't smoking cigars. <laughs> You just outed me to all the homeschool people that follow me faithfully. So thanks for that. My career is over. Well, I, I just out, I just compared you to Charles Spurgeon. That's true. I, you know, listen, that's one of my big arguments is that a lot of great theology has been done over um, cigars. So, it, you know, wh- whether we're talking about the Inklings or whether we're talking about Spurgeon and, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So I feel like I'm in good company. Yeah, I think you're in very good company. <laughs> and uh, look, you know, a lot of guys are trying to figure out what to think right now because the entire thinking process of America is changing right now. And I think people are deeply confused. And on the one hand, they're saying, well, we've seen that there's been oppression, racial oppression and whatnot. But on the other hand, we see people bashing in windows and there's this deep confusion, especially amongst the church. And you have some unbelievable thoughts about that. And they revolve starting with critical theory and, and maybe just help us understand how do we process everything that's going on? How do we stand for justice, but at the same time not align ourselves with people who we know are completely ungodly? Yeah, it, it, it's crazy, crazy days. I mean, it, you know, go back four months and say, here's everything that w- is, is about to happen. I don't think any of us would believe it, right? I mean, um, but, but part of it is there's such a deep, committed tribalism in, in America mm-hmm. where you Amen. belong to a group. And these groups aren't defined by on religious terms or even on truth claims. They're defined essentially by political categories, right? So you're on this side of the line and this side of the line, and you're all in and you're all out. And if you're not all in, then you're actually, you know, a traitor. And 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 it, it does. It gets in the way of actual thinking. Well, there's a lot of things that get in the way of actual thinking, you know, like Twitter, you know, and stuff like that. But um, <clears throat> but you're right. It, it's really hard. And then you have something like what we saw with George Floyd and the uh, what that you know reignited really and yeah it's a it, it's a it's a hard thing to know what's driving uh, some of it uh, I, th- I think Kim we're Christians especially Christian men especially are gonna have to learn to walk and chew gum at the same time in mm-hmm. other words we're gonna have to be able to say this is true and that's true and this is wrong and that's wrong and um, not fall into that that tribalism so what you mean is just because those people believe that, that doesn't make it wrong. Mm. Those people may have some good points, and we need to look at everything through Scripture, not what our particular tribe seem, tends to think of it. Yeah, that's right. And I, I think, too, that um, Christians, because they oftentimes don't have this kind of deep theological grounding or a deep grounding in a Christian worldview, then what happens is 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 we are in this kind of relentless pursuit of relevance, culturally speaking. And it takes one of two forms, right? It takes whack-a-mole, right? This issue pops up and we smack it down, and that issue pops up and we smack it down. Or, um, like I think we've seen as well, churches kind of following whatever's culturally important or culturally popular. And this is something that I think we're going to have to look at ourselves pretty carefully on, is that there's a lot of pastors willing to stand up on Things that might be a little culturally uh, controversial, but usually it has to do with what the culture's already decided is the right position. We kind of are running around behind cult- culture playing cleanup. Oh, yeah. And then kind of saying, yeah, I'm on the right side of history too. You know, oh, I'm here too. And, 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 and you know, one side is uh, kind of using outrage as a strategy, the other side is using uh, justice as a strategy as opposed to, you know, something kind of, you know, deeply uh, uh, held, and, and they both come from the same category. So, for example, in all this race, the, the talk about racism and the racial history of America and the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests and the riots, you put all that together, I don't know how any of us can think well 
about that, or any pastor could preach well about that, unless they had been consistent for the last decade or so on this is what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. Mm. Because otherwise, you're being driven by the cultural agenda or the cultural issue of the day, even if it's an extremely important issue, and even if it has to do with things that are wrong that need to be made right and so on. But we have got to be grounded in things that are unchanging if we're going to be able to navigate uh, (laughs) these crazy days. So in other words, the pastors who've been actually preaching from the Bible can stand up okay, but the ones that continue to try to be relevant, they're finding themselves constantly on the outside looking in because they weren't relevant fast enough. Yeah, that's right. And and I, I, it was interesting, just a couple days ago, I had somebody who had, had a little bit of concern about how his pastor had handled this. And, and look, I, I also want to say this, Ken, because look, pastors have the hardest job in the world. Mm-hmm. They're hired to do one thing, and they're evaluated on something completely different. And in any other industry, we would say that that's not right, this isn't, you know, alignment, so I'm hired to make disciples, and I'm, you know... Uh, uh, measured and evaluated based on, you know, uh, eyeballs and butts. You know, how many eyeballs and butts are part of the thing. And so I, I get it. It's a, it's an extremely, extremely hard job, uh, and I don't want to be kind of the guy that's just throwing them under the bus. But but it was an interesting thing. Uh, you know, the, the, this friend of mine was kind of expressing concern over the way the pastor had responded to specifically that the issue of, uh, of race and, and especially – you know the difference between the phrase "Black Lives Matter" and the uh, the movement "Black Lives Matter," and that how all of that's been hijacked to here and there and everywhere. And he said, "You know, our pastor, you know, talked as if this is the most important thing the church could possibly stand for." And he said, "If that's the case, why hasn't he said anything until now?" <laughs> you know, if this is it's certainly we all know this isn't an issue that happened yesterday. It's an issue that goes all the way back and. Why hasn't he said anything? Where's he been on this for the last 10 years? And and I had never heard anyone kind of put it just kind of that, you know, abruptly <laughs> about this is what it comes across as, kind of whack-a-mole or chasing the wind, you know? Um, and so uh, I, I think there's some things about the church right now. I call them pre-existing conditions, right? In other words, before COVID, before the chaos, before the crisis, before, you know, this, that, or the other, there are... COVID didn't create any of these problems, but it revealed an awful lot. Boy, it did. It was amazing how quickly the churches shut their doors. And I think in... in when it was all happening early March, um, I was up at Liberty University speaking with Tim Clinton and those guys going, oh my goodness, how are churches going to church handle this? But... Nobody knew what was going on, and and I, and I think people justly and rightly said, well, gosh, I mean, this may be a huge deal. We want to protect our people. But now, as they're being ordered to reshut down, and we see that the death rate is with less than 1%, and we don't want to be insensitive to those people, but the ease with which the state and the government was able to shut down churches, um, and you know, it's important. We were talking about not lumping people into one thing or another. Right. We're being a little critical of some pastors. We're not being critical of all pastors, and that's important that good pastors should want bad pastors to be exposed and gotten rid of. And, you know, God has been that way too. I mean, in, in uh, the book of Malachi, you know, he says, you priests, I will I will spread animal poop all over your faces because you're not preaching my word, <laughs> yeah, right? I yeah. mean, that's what he says. Yeah. So, you know, that didn't mean all priests. It meant the ones who weren't preaching his word. And yeah. so... Well, I, yeah, I, I think the shutdowns have revealed so much, and 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 look, I, you know, one of the issues in how we've handled this as a nation has been we've treated you know the entire country like New York City, or we've treated the entire state of Colorado like it was Boulder or something like that, as if there's not a you know a diversity. We actually saw that in the Supreme Court decision uh, having to do with the uh, uh, you know June medical services, which was an abortion related decision that Louisiana was treated exactly like Texas. In other words, the decision was made on the language of the law, not the fact that geographically and demographically they're completely different places. And this universal way of approaching everything is what I think we've seen uh, revealed, uh, you know, in, in, in the church. I mean, you know, look, there's churches that have huge buildings and have the ability uh, to, to, to be wise, and there are churches that don't. There are churches that have a significant number of older folks and churches that don't, and all of that stuff needs to play into, uh, into consideration here. But the thing that I guess concerned me the most was the language of non-essential. 
and how quickly we took that and embraced that title mm. when it was called non-essential. Um, first of all, when certain jobs are called non-essential, I mean, what does that mean? It's not non-essential to that guy, you know, whose job was non-essential. That use of that word was was tragic. There's enough tr- there's enough Christians already who already thought of church as non-essential, right? And that's what concerned me wasn't that the government called church non-essential as m- much as it was so many Christians revealed themselves to have already thought the church was non-essential, a non-essential part of their lives. Is that a problem with the church or is that a problem with the Christian? And I think the answer is yes. It's both, right? Um, but, uh, you know, this is exposed an awful lot. Uh, and, um, you know, the church isn't a non-essential thing as the Scripture describes it, right? It's the gates of hell will not stand against it. You know, this is God's plan A. There's not a plan B, as a friend of mine likes to say. Uh, but, you know, you wonder now. Um, you, you, some churches, re, you know, scared to reopen. Other churches ready to reopen. But Christians going, you know, look, if, if I've got to do this, this, and this, I can just listen to the podcast later, right? And they see no other point of church other than what they can get anywhere else. And that tells you that the church is not essential, at least in their way of thinking. So when Christ said the gates of hell will not prevail against it, he didn't mean it won't prevail against this building that people get together in once a week for an hour and then hurry out of as soon as possible so they don't have to wait in line at the Denny's for breakfast, Mm -hmm. right? So how should we be reacting to that? I mean, how does the church become relevant again? How does it become something more than a place we go to on a Sunday? Mm. Yeah. Well, I, you know, look, if, if a church isn't deeply grounded into a theology of the kingdom, um, then it's just never going to happen. And, I, you know, people want practical ways to do it, and, and this isn't an answer of practicality. It's an answer of worldview. In other words, what is the church for? What did God put the church on the planet for? What did God put Christians on the planet for? I grew up in a Christian home, you know, uh, went to a Christian school my whole life, and when you do that, you have these questions that nag you. And and one of the ones that nagged me was, you know, well, if the whole point is to go to heaven and not go to hell, which is kind of the impression I often got, rightly or wrongly, um, why doesn't God just take me to heaven the moment that I'm a Christian, right? Why am I still here in this limbo in between? Kind of what I saw the world as. And, you know, if he just took me there, it would solve a lot of problems. And then I hit puberty, and I was like, I don't know if I want to go to heaven just yet. <laughs> and, but but, but th- there's this kind of sense that I didn't know what we our salvation was for. And I think that um, if we think that the entire transaction of Christianity is I'm a sinner— and I uh, am now not, you know, forgiven, and that's it. That's the whole thing. Then we completely decontextualize salvation from the larger story of the Bible, which is God creates this world, and God raises up in Christ a, a new creation uh, to help Him in this process of making all things new. Um, and, and, and here's how it impacts the church. Let me get practical, at least on this point. The entire model of the church for a long time, I say the entire model again, I don't want to throw everybody under the bus, a dominant model of the church for a long time has been come and see, come and see, come and see what we're doing, come and see how we're doing this, come and see how we're doing worship, come and see how I'm doing teaching, come and see how I'm doing small groups, come and see how I'm doing you know, a Starbucks in the lobby, come and see, come and see, come and see. That's fundamentally backwards, isn't it? Because the entire point of the church is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, Paul says, Ephesians 4. It's not come and see what cool things we're doing. It's now go and tell, Mm. right? Go and proclaim. Um, You're going to be my ambassadors. So we've kind of set up the business model up front uh, to be a measurement of what happens in here is better than what happens in there when that's never been the point at all. It's been man. It's been stunning the number of pastors um, again because they're measured by so often by eyeballs and, and 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 rear ends that they think well man more people are watching our live stream than would have ever come to our church and now look I, I think that's not a nothing right I'm glad that you know with the work we do we had more at our online conference than a regular conference and I know you know promise keepers just had to make some of those decisions too and we we want to do what we can while we can do it. But the church is a gathering. There's, you know, you, you, that that's what the church is. There's not a there's not a, a, a roundabout way to do that. And and the, and it's this metrics of 
you know, again, just sheer numbers that have consumed what we have produced, and we call that a win. And it just seems like there's a fundamental misunderstanding there. And this comes from your heart. I mean, you took over for Chuck Colson and the Colson Center, and I'm a Colson Fellow. One part of the legacy. that Chuck's yeah. legacy, you know, from prison fellowship to everything else, yeah. So it took well, like a, a it group It took like of four of us, yeah. yeah. We're still, you know, not anywhere close to Chuck. But, but yeah. you, you're you in charge of the part that teaches worldview. Yeah. And, and I went through the, those courses, and it's phenomenal. And anybody listening, if you want to sign up to be a Colson Fellow, it is absolutely worth your time, especially pastors. Yeah. Learning how to think logically and critically and separate issues, mm-hmm. right, is invaluable. And I th- some of the things I learned about the godless way of thinking, this sort of uh, zero-sum game mentality of why do the godless see the things the way they do? And they scream about global warming, and then all of a sudden, oh, wait, let's go bash these windows in and steal stuff, and then global warming is not in the news anymore. And, you know, how dare you get together to church? People are going to catch COVID. But if you're writing, magically, you can't catch COVID. Mm-hmm. And I used to struggle with why do they th- all, why do they think like sheep or, and follow each other around? until I went through the Colson stuff and I learned from Glenn Sunshine and some of those guys you have, oh, that's why they yeah, think that way. Yeah, and well, you mentioned critical theory earlier and that you can't understand what's happening right now unless you understand critical theory. And you got to also understand how ideas work, right? Because, you know, it's kind of like a, uh, um, a, a, a red-blooded atheist. It's really hard to find one, right? I mean, there's very few people that just kind of wear that badge. You know, I'm Richard Dawkins sort of thing. But, you know, what you find is that the whole set of ideas that come along with uh, assuming that God is not a present force in the world, those are infectious, viral sort of ideas that you can find in the way people think everywhere. C.S. Lewis said that the most dangerous ideas are not the ones that are argued, but the ones that are assumed. So if you want to find a real critical theorist, you're going to have to go to a tenured position at a university, right, or a lead reporter job at the New York Times. That's that's where you're going to find those guys, right? I think th- there's some of these ideas that get uh, put into these kind of elite parts of culture, but then you see how they trickle down. And critical theory is absolutely one of those. Now, we've um, both mentioned that a lot. What is critical theory? Let's talk theory? about it, yeah. So critical theory is a way of seeing everything. So that's the first thing you need to know. Um, that there are some ideas that are what we call theories of everything. That's why they almost always uh, fail, is because it's trying to find this single universal universal explanation for everything that exists. And the theory of everything that critical theory puts forward is a theory of power, that the story of the world is a story of power and balance. There are some that have power and that there are some that don't. And when you have power, you always oppress those that don't. So Everybody in the world is divided up into categories, oppressors and oppressed. Now, and that, whether you're in a group or not, is not based on your actions. It's not based on whether you yourself have actually done an oppressing or have been oppressed. It's the group identity that you belong with. Um, And so uh, basically, it's an attempt then to fix this power dynamic that they think exists, not because of the way people behave, but because of the group that they belong to. Now, where this gets complicated, of course, is what group do you belong to, Ken? I mean, clearly, you're a white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, right, male, heterosexual, pretty sure about that part, right? So you, you list that. All of those categories right there mean, A, you belong to at least six groups that we... You I'm know. like the ultimate oppressor. Well, yeah, and all and yeah, all of those are in the oppressor category. <laughs> but then you can think about, well, what about a um, an African American heterosexual woman? But what about an African American homosexual woman, right? So this is where another concept called intersectionality comes in. And intersectionality is kind of like a math game. It's like, you know, well, you get moral authority according to critical theory if you're part of the oppressed group. You lose moral authority if you're part of the oppressor group. So someone who is a white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant male has no moral authority. Someone who is a white, you know, you know, agnostic, uh, homosexual uh, male now has some, some, some moral authority that, that, you know, is given just not because of anything they've done, not because of any accomplishments, not because they themselves necessarily have been oppressed, but because they're part of that group 
that is identified as being an oppressed group. And so it becomes a math game. How many groups do you belong to and how many groups do you belong to? And the only way you can, because you fail all the categories, yeah, yeah, so you, you and me both. So do, so do I, yes, <laughs> I'm, proudly. I'm taller than you, so that makes me a little worse. <laughs> that, no, that's true. That's exactly right. Yeah, well, yeah, and you were part of the police, so that, that yeah, definitely okay, puts yeah. you in a whole other category. But um, where this ends is the only way then we can gain any moral authority is by giving all of ours up. And that's what's called being woke, right? Because you've been awakened to the idea that you're a horrid person because of how you were born, whether you want to be or not. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, that's right. So someone then who could even have all the right ideas about something uh, is, 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 it fails this intersectionality test uh, and so needs to give up the moral authority and the platforming and so on. This is why we see on college campus students kind of running the asylum. Right. This is why we see, um, you know, in the New York Times, Andrew Sullivan. You know that name, a sure. gay blogger, very interesting guy. Wrote a great writer. Oh, great writer. Yeah. I mean, even if he, he, what what I like about him is that he's such an honest and like, and you can disagree with him, but he'll disagree right back in in a really healthy way. But he wrote a article. I think it was called "The Roots of Wokeness," and what he said was, "This explains the New York Times because the New York Times once." doesn't want a diversity of ideas. They want a diversity of identities that all say the same idea, which is why every op-ed at the New York Times, except for maybe Ross Douthat's, sounds exactly the same, even though they're coming from multiple sources. So this is informing critical theory. Then where does this go? It gets taken by um, radicals. Uh, police uh, you know, lose moral authority, and they need to be brought down simply because they belong to all these categories. Um, you know, uh, America's history uh, becomes a, a, a racist history through and through, unredeemable. It absolutely not, you know, absolutely nothing there that can be redeemed or helped out or anything like that. And so that's why we tear down statues. But 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 see, this is where it all gets conflated. This is where the theory of everything fails. Um, I can take you to a town in Mississippi where you can go to the center of town and you can see a statue put up during Jim Crow to intimidate, uh, the, you know, the recently freed slaves uh, or at least a couple generations down the road and talking about slavery and the Civil War as a just and holy cause. Mm -hmm. That statue right there is a statue of white supremacy. That's clear. The same group that wanted to take that down wanted to take down the statue of Ulysses S. Grant, who led the Union forces and fighting the Civil War, or Frederick Douglass, because of his association with the white power structure. It, 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 and not only a statue of a different person, but you know the statue of Mississippi, we know its history. We know why it was put up. A statue in a Smithsonian to tell America, it, it, everything gets thrown into the same theory of everything. Like everything can be explained by these power dynamics. And this is why it's important for Christians we should be leading in logical thought because we have the ultimate truth that other people don't have. Learn to separate logic and these different right. points. And, and the other thing we need to be make sure that we're aware of is this critical theory idea is not new. It's no. been around for thousands of years. I mean, God was dealing with this in Ezekiel when he said, you know, you're responsible for your sins. We don't look at the sins four and five generations down, but the entirety of critical theory says... You, John Stone Street, are responsible for the sins of people from 200 years ago. Forget what you think. Mm -hmm. You're already condemned. You were born condemned. And we're, this pe group over here is okay. It, it's the same godless strategy that Satan's simply looking for different ways to divide people against each other and even themselves, meaning this is one of the reasons why we see a rise in suicide. So many suicides now, people have heard me say 80% of all suicides in America are middle-aged men. Mm -hmm. Why? because they've lost hope, they've lost what their identity is. And so we need to stop lumping all these people into different categories. And we were talking a little bit earlier before we started um, about John Gray wearing a T-shirt with the names of, I think it was nine black people who had been killed by the police, most of them unjustly. We're not sure about all of them, but it didn't look good. And that's the only thing we really got in our virtual experience that was negative. A lot of people were very upset that we allowed him to wear that shirt. But the question is, why are you upset? Were these people unjustly killed? Should they be honored? So, well, the reason obviously is because they can't separate the issue. They see that shirt and they right. immediately throw it into Black Lives Matter. Well, it doesn't say Black Lives Matter on his shirt. He's not, he's just talking about 
justice for these people. And a lot of our pr- presentation was on justice. Mm-hmm. So we as Christians have to stop and go, I'm bothered by that. Why am I bothered by that? It, it's not those names. It's because I'm associating with these things over here. Yeah. And this is the tribalism that I was talking about earlier, yes. because we don't want to belong to this tribe. We see kind of this radical nature of some of these activists and protests. And I and I think absolutely that's, you know, G.K. Chesterton once talked about his brother, and he said, you know, my brother was, uh, you know, born such and such, and we started immediately um, uh, arguing, but we never once quarreled, he said. He said, and that's the problem with a quarrel, is that it ruins a really good argument. And this is exactly what's happened over the last couple months, is that there were some legitimate questions that needed to be answered, having to do with uh, the militarization of the police, having to do with, you know, in, in issues of, you know, legacies of structural uh, evils and sins from America's history. And it got hijacked uh, by this whole critical theory, which completely redefined what it is that we're angry at. Because we're so tribal, and that got identified with the left, those who had been identified with the right turned around and said, well, there's no such thing as structural racism. There's no such thing as injustice. If that's a hero for them, he's an enemy for me. We've got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. That's right. So so I'll give you an example of this, Ken. I'm not even sure we agree on this, so we'll see how, how this goes. I, I, the issue of structural racism. Okay, so the um, that is used now, especially uh, by those and, and critical theorists to explain everything. Structural racism now has become for a specific branch of critical theory, critical race theory. It's become the theory of everything. Everything gets chalked up to structural racism. Uh, you know, differences in pay, differences in employment, um, differences in housing, differences in COVID deaths. You know, everything else. We look at. Some of us look at this issue and say, well, that doesn't explain everything, and what about all these other things? We get accused of whataboutism, and, but we then are tempted to turn around and say structural racism is a myth. we got to go back to the Bible and say, well, wait a minute. Um, racism is a form of sin. Is sin personal or structural? And the answer is... Yes, it's both. Personal sin can actually infect a society. You can see it in Genesis 6. Every thought of every person was only evil all the time. You can see it in uh, structural idolatry uh, and the mistreatment of the poor and, and you know, that the prophets talk about. You Sodom and Gomorrah. You could certainly see it in Sodom and Gomorrah. And you can see it in American history. Jim Crow was clearly structural. No one's going to argue that that's not structural, putting, putting structural... Uh, 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 evils in place based on the sin of racism. So for us to turn around and say there's no such thing as structural racism is the inability to walk and chew gum at the same time. What I want to say is, no, what I know to be true from the Bible about the nature of sin, what I know to be true particularly about bigotry and the inability or the refusal to acknowledge the human dignity that every every person has, that stuff can become structural. But it's also not the explanation for everything. We don't chalk everything up to that. And we also know from Scripture that God determines the exact times and places where everyone lives. So if God puts someone in a particularly vulnerable or difficult situation in their lifetime, then he's doing something way bigger than trying to create a victim out of them. And for me, and just because he blesses the socks off of me like he has, and the time period that I've been born in and, 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 and the family and so on, that actually holds me up to a completely higher level of responsibility because he who has been given much to him much is required, right? So it gives us a completely different set of categories to look at the exact same issues. But for us to get into a yes, it is, no, it's not, yes, it is, no, it's not, that's not biblical, it's not helpful, and it's why Christians by and large oftentimes lose the voice that they should have. And listen, I'll be the first to to critique critical theory. I have critiqued critical theory, but I can critique critical theory and also turn around and say, um, you know, no, racism exist in the human heart. The tendency to separate people out by arbitrary categories exists. It can become structurally embedded. It can probably hang on more than I'm, you know, actually aware. In fact, we got this question the other day uh, from our podcast. Somebody said, you know, what do you, how do you even talk about this when the whole conversation has been hijacked by critical theory? And I said, well, here's an easy way. I'm probably more racist than I think, and I'm not as racist as they say I am. And so let's let's acknowledge the tendency of the human heart to, to dehumanize each other. And we 
do it in a number of ways. Christians can be that voice. Um, but we can if we're not thinking. If we actually thought logically sometimes, we could actually turn this against the godless in many ways. I mean, oh, absolutely. The yeah. people who are talking, the ones championing, championing and, and um, really exaggerating structural racism are the same ones that make sure that most of the abortion clinics are in black neighborhoods. Exactly. They're the same ones that make sure that the black abortion rate is vastly higher than the white abortion rate. So we should just turn around and go, you're right, there is structural racism, and let's talk about murder. Let's Mm -hmm. start with that one. Let's start with that one. I mean, let's start with Margaret Sanger. I mean, I was blown away, happily, that Planned Parenthood of New York decided to cancel Margaret Sanger. But how do you cancel Margaret Sanger when what she initiated into the organization of Planned Parenthood, which was a a eugenics way of controlling the population that she deemed unfit, has been structurally carried out now. That's, by the way, structural evil. I tweeted that the other day. If if Planned Parenthood wants to deal with structural evil, they need to cancel themselves, not Margaret Sanger's picture on the wall. Why? Because 80% of Planned Parenthood abortion clinics are targeted at ethnic minority neighborhoods. And what you're referring to is Margaret Sanger started Planned Parenthood. Yeah, sorry. The founder of Planned Parenthood, she herself was a deep believer in a theory called eugenics, uh, which is interesting because the, the jury's really out whether there was a conscience, uh, sorry, a conscious racism in Sanger or whether she was really driven by this scientific desire because she saw humans as animals and we can breed better animals. That means we can breed better humans. How do you breed better humans? You keep the unfit from reproducing and so on. And that's why she was an advocate of birth control. She was an advocate of women's freedom and so on. Uh, but Planned Parenthood has become structurally racist. They make most of their money uh, uh, off the uh, abortions. The vast majority, percentage-wise, target African American communities. Uh, they're not uh, kept. Uh, they're not given any sort of medical oversight, which is what we saw with Kermit Gosnell's clinic in Philadelphia. Um, you know, it's just one thing after another. So I agree. We can turn this right back around. I'll give you another example of this. One of the one of the problems with the theory of everything is by when you look at all these different ways of identifying people in groups, and usually it's 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 uh, a critical theory. Usually it's race, sex, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration stat immigration well, they status. Well, keep inventing more, so they have more categories. They're, they're, absolutely, um, but think about putting everyone according to those groups that fall into the oppressed category on the same level of oppression. In other words, right now, moral authority is given to transgender males because they fall into this category in terms of sexual orientation and gender identity of an oppressed group. And as an oppressed group, the only way you can elevate them is by getting, giving them cultural power. Well, there's another oppressed group, according to sex, which is women, right? Women, tell me who has experienced historically more vulnerability, more, uh, uh, you know, abuse power in the name of, a, you know, that's become oppression, you know, transgender men or women, historically? By far women, especially in terms of numbers, right? But you have transgender men Using this cl- oppression, cl- this claim of oppression, saying, "Well, we belong in women's sports." Right. So they're using an oppressed status to become oppressors. And if you stick your head up, like Martina Navratilova, I don't know if you saw that story. You remember Martina Navratilova? She used to be part of their group until she didn't stand up for. I, I think she might have been the first lesbian in American history. I mean, you know, she goes way back. She's Fam- been famous tennis player, famous, ten- probably the greatest tennis player in history until Serena Williams, right? And she has advocated for the rights of gay and lesbian teenagers and special rights and so on, things we wouldn't agree with for decades. But she said it's unfair for biological males to compete against biological females in tennis. And suddenly she now is an oppressor. And this is what's missed in this whole power dynamics. Because there's some facts to back that up. I mean, John McEnroe had said... He was announcing a tennis match, and there were, somebody said, Serena Williams, if she was a male ten, or she played against men, she could beat them. And McEnroe said, you're crazy. And then it turned out that Serena Williams had actually played some guy ranked like 700th in the world and gotten destroyed. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, as we do this, what we're actually saying is, well, 
if I can't make the Stanford men's basketball team, then I can tell my tell everybody I'm now a woman and make the women's basketball team and get a scholarship and the, the absurdity of that. But eventually, all of Satan's ideas fall apart on the merits. Today's episode is brought to you through the generosity of Waterstone. For nearly 40 years, Waterstone has assisted givers in supporting their favorite charities, like Promise Keepers, by crafting customized, innovative giving solutions. Waterstone gift strategists stand ready to create your personalized charitable plan, utilizing business interests, real estate, appreciated assets, charitable trusts, giving funds, and more. These donor-specific giving strategies allow givers to bypass capital gains taxes, receive a fair market value charitable deduction, and have tax-free growth for years to come. Prioritize income, minimize taxes, and optimize your giving with Waterstone. Find out how to give and receive the most from your assets by visiting www.waterstone.org. And now, back to today's show. What I find so interesting, when we think logically, when we don't get upset, we don't start to quarrel with other people, we just think about what does God's word say. I find it very interesting that the one group that doesn't get to count as oppressed are Jews, hmm. right? I mean, Ben Shapiro was just on some show, and they're screaming at him because he's a white male, and his Jewishness didn't count. Well, no one's been more oppressed than Jews oh, in the gosh. history of the world. Yeah, in history, yeah. I but mean, they it's... don't get to count exactly like God promised us in Scripture that people who don't have him in their hearts will hate Jews because they're his chosen people. Mm-hmm. No, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I you often think about that. Is you, you hear some of these Jewish skeptics having lived through the Holocaust and everything said, you know, I wish God wouldn't have chosen us because of that sort of <laughs> oppression. And it's it's absolutely it's absolutely right, and it continues today, right? I mean, we had in the wake of um, the uh, emphasis on Black Lives Matter and so on, uh, African American celebrities uh, that would have been canceled in any other situation, but saying anti just flat out anti Semitic sorts of things. And Kareem Abdul Jabbar, of all people, stood up and defended and said, "Look, oppression anywhere is oppression everywhere," and 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 this is. Uh, th- this is what, what the problem, again, one of the problems with critical theory is that critical theory gives that moral authority to uh, 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 oppre- those that are identified as oppressed groups. But what that means is is the, the rules are different for that group. That group then gets a get-out-of-jail-free card. That, gr- that group, especially some, um, and right now the letters of the acronym are high on that list, uh, especially the T's. Um, they you mean by LGBTQ. LGBT, yeah, the, the T's especially get get a pass, um, and they're allowed uh, to to really break rules. This is what we've seen with the um, uh, the, the cover for Antifa and other you know rioting groups is that the rules don't apply to them, right? This is they you know they they get to break laws, you know, not not just social distancing, you know, what are they called? suggestions, uh, but they get to break laws, and it doesn't... Why? Because the moral authority is given by nature of the oppressed status. Now, here's one of the reasons I say Christians can't embrace critical theory, and we actually did a video on this. We have a video series called What Would You Say? And we have a video, four minutes, five minutes, is critical theory biblical? Because a lot of Christians are saying critical theory is a good tool to use. Uh, In other words, it points out the problem. Here's why I don't believe that. Critical theory, first of all, gets the human person wrong. According to critical theory, your most important identif- identity is the groups that you are a part of. Christianity gives us a common humanity, and that is that every single person is made in the image and likeness of God, which transcends that. Christianity doesn't trivialize race. Christianity talks about different tongues, tribes, nations, and languages. That's what Scripture says, but it gives you a common humanity that goes a level deeper, and that is what gives you dignity, Right. Uh, We also understand in the creation as made in the image of God that we have some sort of moral agency. So this moral authority based on the groups that you belong to, which is arbitrary and not consistent and can't be universally applied, the Bible actually says, no, you're given moral agency. So first of all, uh, critical theory gets the human person wrong. Secondly, it gets human sin wrong, because sin now becomes power. And any power according to critical theory, is abusive. 
Now think about that. Any power dynamic, any any hierarchy is necessarily an abusive one. Can you think of any hierarchies that aren't abusive? Well, what about a teacher-student? You know? It, now, it can be. Don't get me wrong. A, a teacher can abuse his position of authority and influence and so on. But how is a student going to learn if a teacher actually, if that hierarchy is not in place? I have a three-year-old son. Everywhere we went for the last two weeks, he told everyone he's Spider-Man. Like, literally. That's how he introduced it. He introduced us to Spider-Man. I'm pretty sure he's convinced of it, right? Now, I've got to tell him he's wrong sometimes because I don't want him to try to web out of his hand and jump off the roof, right? Which is a real possibility with this kid. He's kind of crazy. <laughs> um, that is me imposing my authority on my son. But the dynamic is not abuse of power. The dynamic is love. Christianity is built on a universal authority. I wanted to ask you about one of my favorite quotes that you made, okay. which is um, what was unthinkable 10 years ago mm-hmm. is unquestionable today. And we've been circling around that. But specifically, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I think that, um, I mean, that some ideas make other ideas thinkable, make other ideas possible. And some ideas make other ideas inevitable. In other words, when you can't jump off, in other words, I'm going to quote Dallas Willard here, you can't jump off the roof and not hit the ground. Uh, Another way to say this is ideas have consequences. We often say bad ideas have victims. All of this gets into this realm of when we are a culture that deprioritizes thinking, we're a culture that thinks ideas are just for the nerds. Ideas are just for the intellectuals. These are ideas that belong on a page. And if they're not practical, they don't matter. Um, we have a idea right now, which was unthinkable yesterday and is unquestionable today, culturally speaking. And that is that not only gender, but sex itself is a social construct. So when it comes to very, very physical activities like having sex or giving birth or going to the bathroom or uh, something like that, then whether you have a penis or a vagina is irrelevant. I mean, think about that. I mean, we're talking about the most physically engaged activities that you can possibly imagine. Sex, childbirth, going to the bathroom. And we're talking about them now as a culture, as if penises and vaginas are irrelevant to Until the Until you go to the doctor, and then all of a sudden it becomes very relevant again. Yeah, and how you, you know, no, yeah, which condition you have and, you know, so on. It, it all is, yeah, it, it, it is a fundamental flat-out denial of, 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 of re- observable reality. But where does that come from, right? It didn't just come onto the scene. It, you know, when Charles Darwin proposed the idea that— um, all living things had a, had, a, had a common ancestor that revolved solely out of natural processes. He wasn't the first one to propose that idea. But there were other ideas that had been in place around the Enlightenment and, and, and the scientific revolution that made that idea thinkable. There were other th- ideas in place from the sexual revolution that sex, marriage, and babies are separable. They're not a package deal. Uh, that men and women should be interchangeable in rights, and men and cha- women should be interchangeable in roles. And that made possible, well, men and women are interchangeable in reality, right? In other words, that's what I mean, that something that was unthinkable yesterday is unquestionable today. And this is why I think there's this wonderful passage of Scripture, I think it's in Hebrews, where it talks about David, who was faithful to his generation, That's why we have to be faithful to the ideas and the truth claims that are taking place in our generation. Because if we lose a generation here, more is to come tomorrow. Does does that make any sense? I'm going to put this into terms that someone like me can understand. And I'm going to talk about Mork and Mindy a little bit. um, (laughs) I I, I remember that show. (laughs) (laughs) I was actually watching the the debut of Mork and Mindy with my kids on TV a couple weeks ago. And my adult children. And... It, it, it talks about it, the, the pilot episode. Remember, Mork is an alien that comes down and he lives with Mindy. Right. And 1978, 79. And there's a policeman standing there when someone else runs up to Mindy's father in the music store in Boulder and says, Mindy's living with a man. And Mindy's father said, that can't be. Mindy's not that kind of girl. 
And the policeman said, it goes, you want me to go run him out of town? And they're like, well, no, this is pretty drastic, but I don't think it's come to that yet. It must be something else. Now, that was a normal mainstream TV show in 1979. Minnie's not that kind of girl. And we all just kind of accepted the fact that a cop would run the guy and, out of town. What it, what's meant by he's not, not that kind of girl is that she wouldn't do that. She would not. Not be, that she was a lesbian, which is what that line would mean oh. on a sitcom today. <laughs> She's not that kind of a, Thank right? Thank you for clarifying. I mean, no, exactly. Yeah. audience under 30. Yeah, exactly. That's so what, she's not that kind of girl. She would not dare be having sex outside right. of marriage. That was 1979. Now, you think about Seinfeld or Melrose Place that were popular shows in the early 90s where everyone was sleeping with everybody. Friends, Right. right. That was 13, 14 years later. Mm -hmm. That's how fast. That's how fast it goes. It changed. Yeah. If we America, if we the church, don't start getting engaged and involving ourselves. We see this train running so quickly. We forget that in 2008, 2008, the state of California voted down gay marriage. Right. They well, voted we to make it that illegal. In 2008, that same year, President Obama, who's known as the first gay president. He was he ran on a platform in which he said marriage is between a man and a woman. He said that on the stage at Saddleback Church, Rick Warren's church. And then he famously evolved. And that was one of those key things that took something unthinkable and made it unquestionable. The day after he announced that, New Zealand voted on same sex marriage. That was the power of that. But you know, uh, his Joe Biden, vice president under President Obama, uh, once said that, Will and Grace did more than anything else to help us think about this. And he was talking about same-sex marriage, which is a fascinating line because Will and Grace never dealt with same-sex marriage. But what did Will and Grace do? You remember that show? Yeah, that was in the line. So you start with, this is Thursday night, must-see TV lineup on NBC back when everybody watched that kind of TV. You start in the 80s, and it was the Cosby Show. Cosby Show centered around a home. The family is a good thing, not a bad thing. You have a problem, you go to mom and dad, they fix the problems, you know, that sort of stuff. The very next decade, same night, same, uh, same, same network, number one show for the decade of the 90s was Friends. Number two show is Seinfeld. Suddenly, it's not centered around the home, it's centered around a group of friends in New York City. Suddenly, right, you, when dad shows up in the Cosby show, he's going to fix the problem. When dad shows up in Seinfeld, remember George's dad? Yeah, he's not fixing the problem. He is the problem, right? So you go in one generation. That's 10 years. Family's a good thing to family's a bad thing. Now, one more step to Will and Grace, which was the very next show put into that lineup. You remember that must-see TV Thursday night, NBC? And Will and Grace, Will's not the first homosexual character on television that goes all the way back to Soap, I think, and what's his name? Uh, Billy Crystal. But he is the first lead character. And you think about that. Grace is heterosexual. Will's homosexual. Where does Grace go to get her problem solved? Will plays the role in Will and Grace that Cliff Huxtable played in The Cosby Show. 20 years later. 20 years later. And so you start doing this math, and then you start really. I often think about this, too. When I was growing up, um, the, the show that scandalized my parents, you know, and, and my Christian youth group was Beverly Hills 90210. You remember that? It was a little bit late in my teenage years, but everyone was scandalized because they talked about sex. They never did it. In that show, they never did it, but they talked about it a lot. Fast forward to Glee. Hmm. Which was just Beverly Hills 90210 20 years later. 20 years later. Not only do they talk about it, they do it. And not just heterosex, it's homosex, it's pansex. In other words, this it's it's a whole exploration of the whole thing. I don't even know what pansex thing. is, man, but don't explain it to me. It's Miley Cyrus. That's all you need to know. <laughs> That's how she identifies. But here's the other thing that was crazy about that is Beverly Hills 90210 was set in Beverly Hills. That's the edgy coast, right? Glee set in Indiana. Is that right? Yeah, Indiana. So you go from Beverly Hills to Indiana, and this is the power of, uh, of, of culture. Um, culture is powerful because it normalizes things. So, John, you know, I, I think the conversation we're having right now is a conversation that a lot of people are having. But I think um, where we always want to go in these podcasts is what do I do about yeah. it? What, I'm a man listening to this, so what am I supposed to do? Yeah, well, here's what you need to do. Read a book. <laughs> no, really. I mean, look, the, the numbers are stunning. The number of grown men that never read another book um, after they graduate high school is is crazy. It's shocking these days. It is. And, well, um, a publisher, I mean, we're both writers, 
And publishers will often say, look, I mean, it's women who read books. So you oh, have to absolutely. write the book and we have to publicize the book so that it appeals to women. Otherwise, it's not going anywhere. Because the only books that men do read, the few are the ones our wives hand them and say, you're going to read this. And, 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 and it, it Which be, is a terrible... It, it'd be bad enough if we didn't just read books, right? But what we do is instead of reading books, we, in the words of Neil Postman, who was a, a brilliant thinker about the impact that entertainment was having on us... We, we, we substitute the time stretching our minds, thinking deep thoughts, uh, wrestling with ideas and, and things that matter, and we amuse ourselves to death. You know, you know the, the number one demographic that buys video games is 30-year-old men? Wow. They play more video games than 18-year-olds. There's a word for this. It's called Peter Pan syndrome or um, <laughs> failure to launch is what some people have called it, e- eternal adolescence. Um, you know, we, we say boys will be boys, but we're talking about 20-some-year-olds, right? In other time periods of history, they would be uh, fighting battles. They would be managing large, you know, farms, um, you know, the, the uh, it, it, and it's created this whole—I could keep going on this. It's created this whole cultural instability, right? So uh, right now, the average married marrying age is almost 30, the average age where a woman has her first child is younger than when she has her first marriage. Okay, that's on average across the United States. Wow. That's all communities. And we also have the population rate in America is dramatically falling. We've now been below the replacement rate for two or three years at 1.7. 2.1 is the, you know, where is all this coming from? What's well, coming from the fact that we're not having babies, right? It, instead, we want lives that can be on our own terms. We support. We, we don't get married, stay single, cohabitate, and then have fur babies, right? Um, a, fur? a fur baby is this new trend. I don't want a baby. I'm going to have a pet. And so you treat a dog like a baby. You spend tens of thousands of dollars on this pet, right? And, um, you know, a buddy of mine walked up to the, uh, uh, air, the, the gate he was flying out of. This is pre-COVID. And he saw a child on a leash and a dog in a stroller. And he's like, that's all you need to know about America right there. 2020. 2020. There we go. You know, let's talk about history just real briefly as, okay. we, as we move through this. We see the rise of empires and the fall of them fairly quickly in, in history as soon as those empires become comfortable. Mm-hmm. I mean, the first global empire was Babylon. And what happened in Babylon is that they got real lazy real quick. And the Persians came in when they weren't paying attention, took over. The Persians got real lazy real quick and Alexander the Great right. took, took them out. Alexander the Great, I mean, it, that didn't last long. Mm-hmm. He dies and then everyone fights over what a greater man than them did. And then that falls apart. And then Rome, and we know famously that Rome fell apart because eventually it was all immigrants fighting in their armies, no Romans anymore because they got lazy. And we can go keep going. It's yeah. The Spanish, the great Spanish empire and on and on. Now we look at America and we see that um, there was great concern over the failure of masculinity in the 1800s, mm-hmm. but we had World War I, which engaged all of the young men had to go fight a, a new war, and then World War II, the next generation, and then Vietnam, the next generation, not quite as effective because not everybody went to Vietnam, just the poor did. Mm-hmm. But now we see, for the first time, a generation of men who, for the most part, didn't serve in the military, didn't grow up on a farm, mm-hmm. and had a, an issue of fatherlessness where there was no one to teach him how to be a man. Right. And that's a, that's a huge difference from the 1800s, right? Uh, in other words, we, we've had times where things got tough and there was a problem with public morality and virtue. But losing the social institutions that make that normalize certain behavior, I mean, it's one thing where there's a high rate of divorce if it's still in a culture that thinks divorce is not the best thing. But in a culture like ours that doesn't see any difference whatsoever between cohabitation and marriage, and there's no taboo whatsoever for divorce, then suddenly there's not social norms or social institutions. You cannot, you cannot overestimate the difference between that time and this time when it comes to fatherlessness. Without fathers in the home, they're literally, uh, you have... You, you you don't have a crucible to develop trust, to develop character, to develop reliability, to develop responsibility. Um, there, there is uh, there literally is it, it's a devastating thing. It's one of the rules of civilization that if you break it, you you can't. You, 
maybe we'll figure out a way to keep going, you know, you know, as Ross Douthat's new book calls it a decadent society. In other words, we'll just putter along. And the good news is, is everybody else is screwed up in their countries too, right? Like China might have a big military, but they're in a disaster. And Russia, you know, in other words, the good news is, is everyone is a disaster right now. So we don't have a big enemy. And maybe that's our best hope. Well, yeah. And the thing of it is, though, is people look, you know, in an absence of unity, they look for a common enemy. Yeah, And we, circling us back to critical theory, we're, we're kind of winding down this conversation. I think it's very important to bring everything you said back to fruition because I remember 10 years ago thinking, I hope Jesus is going to come back soon, but I'm not sure that he can because I don't see any situation in which we could have such persecution of Christians mm-hmm. and a unified world the way Revelation describes it. Suddenly, now, 2020, I'm going, if you follow critical theory to its fruition you see that Christians will be the ultimate oppressors. And we're already starting to see that language happen. Mm-hmm. The Christians are the ones that did it all. The Christians it wasn't a white people. Oh, yeah, we're past the, the cultural debate. Like, it's no longer like, well, is the Christian view of sexuality true or is it prudish or it's old-fashioned? Now it's evil. Mm. That's, a, that's a different sort of category. So I see the globe. Uh, now, we don't know Christ is coming back, no. and anybody who claims to is a liar. And there have been awful times before. So, yeah. yeah. Everyone was convinced Napoleon was the Antichrist. Everyone thought Charlemagne was the Antichrist, you know. Um, but if we're heading this way, we, we're starting to see now how it could happen because we're starting to see a world in massive dysfunction looking for a common enemy. And boy, we Christians, and I mean, they're saints and they're Christians, right? The, the lukewarm, comfortable Laodicean, Revelation chapter 3, if you don't know what I mean, Christians are really giving them good excuses to, yeah. to, for us. So we are starting to see for the first time technology um, and, and, and the unification of the world around a common enemy where we could see the rise of an antichrist and the hatred of Christians. So, you know, as we wind down, I want to ask, you know, last question. We're talking, you know, a lot of big picture stuff. We're talking about history and the fact that we're now in a place, not just in America, but in the Western world and even beyond the Western world, of an epidemic of fatherlessness. Mm-hmm. What, again, back to our question from earlier, where do we go? What do we Christians do? Yeah, well, I mean, look, we, we need to be different, um, you know, and, 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 and I say that, and it sounds like I had an old guy in my church who used to say, man, it ain't rocket surgery. <laughs> and at some <laughs> level, I kind of think he's right. And you look at Proverbs, and Proverbs is full of such base, simple wisdom that today seems absolutely revolutionary, mm-hmm. right? Because it's so out of the ordinary. But look, we, we, we do know that in history there, there, there's different cycles that you can see, right? And, and one of them has to do with masculinity, maleness, and, you know, who knows how quick—I mean, look, how quickly can things change? You know, we're middle 2020. You know, if we had this conversation six months ago, none of this that we've talked about almost would be on the radar, at least not a lot of it. But but I will say this. There's a cycle in history that we see, which is hard times uh, produce strong men. Strong men produce great times. Great times produce weak men. Weak men produce hard times. And that's the cycle. And you can kind of see where we're at in this whole thing. I don't think it's a flawless one. Uh, and I'm certainly not wishing for hard times to, um, you know, for everybody in order to, um, uh, you know, have a revitalization of masculinity or, or strength or, you know, faithfulness to Jesus. It's not a wish. It, it's just more of a reality, and we know where we are in this cycle. I think there, there's some instruction there, though, to answer your initial question for dads like us, right? I mean, look, I, I can't decide, you know, that um, whether or not, you know, America is going to stop being captive to silly little amusing social media, glowing rectangle and video games, right? But I can decide that with, when it comes to my family, when it comes to my own life, when it comes to my own son. And I, I often think of that wonderful scene uh, in uh, The Patriot, you know, right when he, you know that movie, The Patriot? When he the guy to death, is that the wonderful scene? Yet? That's the one, right before that, actually. <laughs> but, you know, his one son's been shot. He's going to go save his other son. He grabs his two boys. He runs out into the woods. It's this, and Mel Gibson's such a great actor in these sorts of movies. He turns around. He's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. And he's realized he's talking to a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old. Like, okay, here's what's about to happen. But, but, but he, he, the two parts of that, he goes, 
boys, what did I teach you about shooting? Uh, he was about to put them in the craziest time of their life. But they had something to fall back on. They had the absolute, they had it. And they knew it. Aim small, miss small, right? In other words, go back to these basics. And even that aim small, miss small, right? Like, as, as Christians, I think we've got to figure out, we've got to change the world. God's given you a corner of the world. He's given me a corner of the world. He's certainly given me my own family. I, I think sometimes we spend so much time thinking about what we can't do. We don't do what we can do. Right, which is her own backyard. Like, get her done, man. To quote Larry the Cable Guy, after quoting, you know, well, I'll the quote, I'll quote Jesus because I'm more godly than you. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Jesus said, <laughs> "If you're faithful in little things, I'll give you greater things." Well, that's it, and 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 you've seen that, and this is your story, right? In so many, so many ways. Um, but that's uh, you, you know that 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 is so important that we. Take care of our corner, take care of our family, take care of our kids. And, and by the way, I mean, we've talked about demographics and all that. One of the hopes that I have is, you know, of where the world's going and what's it going to look like is, look, the future belongs to the fertile. If, you know, everyone that's weak is having, uh, uh, not only having fur babies instead of real babies, but they're not taking care of raising strong leaders. And we, as Christian men, love our families, care for our families, disciple our kids, take care of what we can take care of. And by the way, look after the knucklehead boy who doesn't have a dad who shows up at our church and take care of him as well. You know, the math adds up, you know. It's not math. My friend Warren says it's not magic, it's math, right? You just... D- do that next thing. I was an English major, so I did think they were the same thing, <laughs> trying to figure out math. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, and what you're saying is so important. We need to start to look for boys to mentor because yeah. they don't have dads. If if all the men out there listening to me right now and just saying, hey, uh, especially if you have teenage boys or even younger um, who, who have friends, and start a little Bible study for them. Make it entertaining. Yeah, And, of course, in, in order to teach it, it means you have to know something. But grab a book, a resource, promisekeepers.org, has a bunch of stuff on there for you. Uh, John Stone Street has a bunch of stuff. What, what, give us your website, Bob. Yeah, breakpoint.org, breakpoint.org. We do a daily commentary that Chuck Colson started called Breakpoint. That's the easiest way. Come to our website, sign up for the email. Or um, we put it out on a podcast so you can just look up the Breakpoint podcast. And so what I would tell you is if you don't know what they teach on, you want to do something, go onto that website and just listen to John's, because you they're like three minutes, oh, They're right? like three minutes, and yeah, in fact, I have a lot of dads that tell me that that's what people, that's what they talk about with their teenagers over dinner, right? So that's what they do. If you get the Promise Keepers app, if you go on there, on that app, there is a daily devotional. It's about five minutes, it's a video, and it's guys like John Stone Street and me and, and David Benham and, and different people just giving a five-minute podcast or a little devotional on video, but these are things that can help you to know, well, what should I teach these kids on? They're all going to show up. I'm going to have five kids that are 13. What do I teach on? Man, go look at these Just different resources. Yeah, it's it's not hard. You guys have put out some great resources, Ken, and that's why I'm such a fan and just rooting for PK in so many different ways. Because there's so many roots of all these sociological and demographic and historical things that go right back to what do we do with men? I mean, Margaret Mead, who we wouldn't agree with on anything, said the central role of any society is to decide what to do with men. And, of course, she thought the best place for men was on Mars, but uh, <laughs> but, but her point is actually right, which is, listen, if, if men are, are strong and redemptive and loving and, uh, um, and uh, uh, stewarding well the, the ground that God's given them, uh, then you, you see what can happen. So you know, as we sign off, let's talk about, or let's just think about being proactive, guys, where in your sphere, you don't have to have some massive amount of talent. You don't have to have a huge IQ. What can you do in your sphere? You start with your family. You start with your wife, right? If there's dysfunction in your marriage, the first thing you think of is, what do I need to do to change me so that we have a better marriage? And when you got that all net down, you get to start thinking about her when you'll never have it all down. So... Um, yeah. You just worry about how you're going to lead your family in humility and grace. And same thing with your kids. And as you begin to think a little bit wider, how can I help three or four boys down the street? Just mentor them, teach them the Bible once a week, take them to a ball game, um, whatever you can do. But what can I do in my little sphere to change it? If it's true that there's 60 million voting age evangelical Christians in America, well, if all 60 million the women started teaching the younger women and the older men started teaching the younger men how fast would we change America. But it starts with you because what Satan wants to do is say, well, I can't, 
I can't do anything. I mean, who am I, right? I mean, that's Satan's biggest lie to us all. I don't matter. Right. Let those people do it. Well, we've now gotten to a point in the church where all of us are look, waiting for those people to do it instead of, uh, God saved me so that I could do whatever is it within my talent. Start with little things, and then God will give you bigger things. John, and you're awesome, man. Ah, it's always good to be with you, man. Thanks, brother. Yeah. Thanks for listening to On the Edge Podcast with Ken Harrison. For a lot of you, this is our first time meeting, and I want to tell the men listening about an organization I'm the current chairman of, Promise Keepers. Promise Keepers is an organization founded by Coach Bill McCartney that's led men across the world to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Promise Keepers is calling men back to courageous and bold servant leadership. To learn more and get involved in the mission of Promise Keepers, visit promisekeepers.org. Follow on social media or download the Promise Keepers app on Apple Store or Google Play by searching Promise Keepers. Through the Promise Keepers app, you receive access to devotionals, Bible studies, and other great articles and video content, and a community to build friendships, lead your family, and become transformative leaders. See you next time for On the Edge with Ken Harrison. Mm-hmm.